start. Thank you for coming, everybody. I think you're all aware that this is uh, part of an activity within CESAR called Work Package E, where we have the possibility of doing some pieces of research which are not part of the main uh, CESAR thrust. Uh, we do this with universities and uh, with uh, research centres and so on. We started a couple of years ago about 18 projects, one of which was a uh, poem that you'll see today. Uh, because we've done them, we've been doing them for another year, already a year or two, we've, we're coming to the point where we're closing out projects, and part of the closeout is to have a technical presentation, which you'll hear this morning. What we do afterwards, actually, is we, we go through the, the practical, the administrative stuff to make sure the project is clean before we uh, can close it properly. Our presenters today are Andrew Cook from uh, University of Westminster, who's going to be doing most of the talking, I think. Christabel from Inaxis and Graham Tanner from Westminster are here also from the, uh, from the project team. So I think without further ado, Andrew, I'll hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much for taking the time. I know everyone uh, has very busy schedules. So thank you very much for taking the time to come to uh, listen to the presentation this morning which I'm very pleased to make on behalf of the consortium, the work undertaken um, jointly by University of Westminster and Inaxis in, in Madrid. Po the project is POEM, which is uh, looking at passenger-oriented enhanced metrics. And just before I start, I'd just like to make a few um, acknowledgements for people who have supported and helped us during the course of the project. Firstly, CODA, who have been extremely patient in answering a, a very large number of annoying questions that arrive from Westminster on an almost weekly basis. I imagine they began to dread every time an email arrived from Andrew Cook or Graham Tanner at the University of Westminster. They were very patient and supportive in their help. PRU, especially Holger there, who was very helpful in helping us with a lot of data queries. Innovator, a company based, you may not know, uh, you may, in the UK and the US, who provide, amongst other things, things like aircraft configuration data and airline schedules. And they helped us out with some very generous deals in terms of data purchase when we started to run out of data budget halfway through the project. They very kindly gave us some good reductions on that data. And IATA in Montreal, who very kindly came to a helpful financial arrangement with us for supplying us with some airline passenger data that we negotiated, in fact, for several months during the proposal stage of the project. Because otherwise, had we had to purchase that at the official rack rates, the, the project wouldn't even be able to start. So thanks in particular to those four. I'd also like to thank a number of people who were engaged um, throughout the project through workshops and site visits. Um, the first one was a workshop that we had at the University of Westminster near the start of the project, which was basically a consultation process relating to the metrics that we designed in the project. And mostly input there came from airlines and ANSPs. We then had two case studies. Uh, the first case study was looking at um, passenger connectivity through airports and we had a lot of collaboration there from the airport authority at Zurich and also the Technical University of Zurich, ZHAW. We also had a workshop at Gatwick, uh, mainly attended by airlines, although some people here today were, were also present at that workshop in Gatwick. And there we were looking at en route delay recovery and passenger reaccommodation protocols um, from airlines. So basically, throughout the project, we tried to engage stakeholders, particularly airlines, to make sure what we were doing made operational sense um, in the airline context. And we, we hope we managed to do that to a reasonable extent. Today, I'm going to uh, an overview of the project. I'm going to start off uh, with just one or two slides on the background and objectives. And I think it's quite important to set a little bit of context into terms of the context in which the project sits in terms of the um, performance scheme, Regulation 261, flight prioritisation, where we're going within CESAR and CONOPS with respect to flight prioritisation, how that fits into the project, and current ATM and ATFM performance. Then we move on to the results and the model itself, looking at delay costs and the passenger context, something about the tool, how we built the software, and some of the key results and then two slides at the end on the next steps. So firstly, what did we do? What do we want to do in the project? We wanted to build the first network simulation model for the whole of Europe 
for one day, which included all the flights and all the passengers on those flights and all the associated costs of delay. So we've got an explicit passenger connectivity model and we wanted that to realistically capture airline decision making in terms of disruption um, under delay, for example, including airline costs. And in that, we designed a new set of metrics for measuring system performance, which we'll describe in some detail later on, passenger-centric and propagation-centric metrics. And also, critically, the whole simulation operated under a series of flight and passenger prioritization scenarios. So we ran the simulations under these different types of scenarios and then looked at the results in terms of performance as measured by traditional metrics and new metrics, which will be the main core of the results that we present later on. So the key tasks which are related to understand how performance, the performance trade-offs under these different prioritization scenarios and how the different prioritization scenarios that we applied um, affected the propagation of delay through the network. The project was very much um, design and data front-loaded, by, by which we mean from, in fact, before the project started, we spent a lot of time looking at data and data cleaning algorithms, which took a, a tremendous amount of time within the project. And also the, the design process for the metrics started very early on. And as I've mentioned, it also included um, some stakeholder workshops and two airline case studies. Now I'm going to look at a little bit of the context, so I don't just suddenly want to fall into some slides presenting the results without setting the context of what's going on in the wider ATM context and why we're doing this. Probably everyone here is already quite familiar, so I won't spend too long on the performance scheme, essentially looked after by PRB and sets binding targets on EU states. It's split along three reference periods, RP1, which has just started, RP2, and RP3, which starts in 2020. RP1, the focus on these metrics and performance was on route capacity, environment, and cost efficiency. And the draft reporting of the first year results, i.e. 2012, for performance in the EU states, was published a couple of weeks ago. Generally positive performance across the states. And we can also access results from the EU dashboard, um, which is looked after and produced by PRB. RP2, which starts in 2015, extends the scope of this performance framework to full gate-to-gate -gate scope, and the exact targets for RP2 have to be agreed by the end of 2013. And these are going to focus on the ICAO KPAs of capacity, environment, cost efficiency and safety. Those EU-wide targets were released very recently on the 27th of September and there was a workshop here um, on Monday looking at the initial results from performance in RP1 and target setting in RP2. So why have I put that here? Two reasons. One is when we look at some slides later on about performance, we can set those in the context of these performance targets which are binding on the EU states. And secondly, we can see that RP2, the design of the metrics within RP2, is now pretty much closed down. Those targets have actually been proposed by PRB earlier this week, or last week I should say, and those will become binding and, and imagine, we imagine passed by the Commission by the end of the year. So anything we do in terms of extending the set of metrics which are used uh, in this context, for example introducing passenger-centric metrics, would have to be looking towards RP3, which starts out at 2020. So we've still got a bit of time um, to do that. Although the two years for this project just disappeared like that, so I imagine the years between now and 2020 will go just as quickly. Regulation 261, the other side of the coin in terms of the regulatory context, is the Air Passenger Compensation and Assistance Scheme, which was introduced by the Commission in 2005. That covers flights outbound from the EU, all flights going out of the EU, and all flights coming into the EU operated by EU carriers. It currently covers denied boarding, so passengers have compensation and care duties imposed on the airlines that have to look after them if they're denied boarding, under cancellation, and based on departure delay. There's nothing at the moment on arrival delay, and there's nothing at the moment binding if a passenger misses their connection. To cut a very long story very short, this regulation isn't working very well. Um, there's been a long consultation process by the Commission. There's been a number of changes proposed on a consultation document which could become law if agreed by the Member States by 2015. 
And the key points there are that the care and assistance will be made obligatory to passengers after only two hours of delay, regardless of the length of the flight. At the moment, it's quite a complicated set of rules to operate between one and a half hours and five hours of delay according to the flight length and flight duration. So it's quite complicated for the airlines and the passengers to implement. Airlines will be obliged in future, they'll actually have an obligation to reroute passengers onto other carriers after 12 hours if they can't reroute on their own system, which at the moment a number of airlines actually don't do. And interestingly, the same rights for delays will become applicable to passengers in terms of missing connections, which is an important contact for this project since we're looking um, quite centrally at passenger connectivity. And also there'll be compensation for long days, uh, long delays including arrival delay, also an important thing we've looked at as part of this project. New obligations regarding disruption information and better definition in the regulation for what extraordinary circumstances count as. Because a number of airlines, as we've, I'm sure we've all heard in the press, are trying to use this extraordinary circumstances clause to avoid paying compensation uh, to passengers. So they're trying to tighten up the regulation with respect to that. Now what we've done in POEM, we've done two things within the project, and I'll explain them in a few slides time a little bit more uh, clearly. We've incorporated the, the Regulation 261 in terms of the cost model that we've built in POEM. So it's, it's, it's driven to some extent based on Regulation 261 and to some extent based on what the airlines do in practice and how they handle Regulation 261. So we've, we've linked it to the regulation and to airline practice. And some of the prioritisation prioritization scenarios in the model, we've looked at what would happen if Regulation 261, if some of these rules, some of these changes here, if they were introduced and the airlines were forced to do more, then how would that affect performance um, as delivered to the passenger? So we've modelled some of that as well. Let's look at the context of flight prioritisation itself, because, as I've said, the scenarios we've run in the model in some way or another, all either prioritise flights and or passenger rebooking and passenger reaccommodation. Uh, re so we've got two different types of prioritisation in the model. At the moment, as we all know, we're operating under first plan, first served, which is strategically a very fair starting point, although under tactical disruption, it doesn't operate as a cost minimisation. We have a number of principles here, currently operating in ATM, for example, heavy constraints on routing, very limited opportunities for ATFM swapping. And of course, all that's going to change under the paradigm shift, the famous business 4D trajectory, which we're moving towards, which is part of the CESAR concept of operations. So CESAR CONOPT is based along three operational steps. Step one is essentially focused on time-based operations. Step two, trajectory-based operations. And step three, performance-based operations. So in step one, we have control times of arrival. Step two, we move on to full 4D, multiple control times of overfly, including on unpublished waypoints. And by step three, 2025, plus plus, or plus plus plus, we have free routes. Important in all this is the user-driven prioritization process, a key component, UDPP. It is essentially a mechanism whereby airlines can request priorities um, for flights which are in some way restricted. And previously, under initial planning, the concept of UDPP was going to be introduced as a second level solution after demand and capacity balancing had failed. But CONOPS, CONOPS 1 has extended the scope of that, we've noticed in the documentation, to include all normal situations and all phases of flight although the greatest applicability will still be during capacity restrictions and on pre-departure. It's a consensus-seeking process which involves airline iterations to provide a consensual solution during disruption. And if that were to fail, there's uh, to be a network arbitration function in place to resolve the iteration process. So the key point here is the context that UDPP is still very much on the agenda, and if anything, of increasing importance than it has been, say, two or three years ago. So very much important in the way that CONOPS is developing. And it's a central part of exploring some of these different flight prioritization scenarios and rules as part of our project, although because we're in CESAR work package E, we're free to explore whatever scenarios we want, and we're not tied necessarily to the planning that currently exists within CONOPS 1 
or ConOps step two. Although because we're in Cesar Work Package E, we're free to explore whatever scenarios we want, we want, and we're not tied necessarily to the planning that currently exists within ConOps 1 or ConOps Step 2. Let's have a look at uh, ATM performance um, as it stands at the moment. We can see here, we look at some key metrics for performance for the years 2010 and 2012. And the reason I've compared those two years is 2010 is the year on which our model is based, because that's what we had all the traffic and passenger data for when we started the project. And 2012 is the year for which we have the latest four years' worth of statistics. And we can see that the flights between the two years um, have increased, have grown slightly. If you look at passengers, total passenger numbers across the EU 27, i.e. before Croatian accession, then those have dropped slightly. If you look in PRR reporting, for example, the passenger numbers have grown to some extent between 2010 and 2012, and that's because, for example, the PRR reporting includes the whole ECAC area, which also encompasses quite a lot of growth uh, in Turkey, for example, which has helped to drive the passenger numbers up. If we look at the average departure delay in 2010, that was pretty awful. It was uh, an average of 14.8 minutes of delay on average across all aircraft for 2010. And although in 2010 traffic levels were lower than they were in 2007, that year was the worst on record ever for departure delay performance at 14.8. Since then, if we look at arrival delay, for example, the number of aircraft, uh, the proportion of aircraft arriving more than 15 minutes late, that's dropped quite a lot from 2010 for 24% odd down to just under 17% uh, in 2012. And in fact, that's the best performance we've ever had since we started keeping these records, or, or CODA and PRU, uh, PRU did. Uh, in 2001. So that's the best year on record so far. Bearing in mind we've got quite low traffic and the major reason driving that increase in performance uh, between 2010 and 2012 is an improvement in en route ATFM delays. Interestingly for us we can see that nevertheless reactionary delays in the network have stayed almost the same between those two periods just above 46% in 2010 and just below 46% in 2012. And just in case somebody doesn't know, a reactionary delay is a delay to an aircraft caused by an inbound aircraft when this aircraft is either waiting for connecting passengers or connecting, connecting crew. So it's a knock-on effect in the network from one aircraft to another. So roughly just under half of all the delays in the network are reactionary or knock-on delays from other aircraft and or connecting passengers and or connecting crew. In fact, most of that is driven by passenger connectivity. If we look at the performance of the average en route ATFM delay for the whole year, we can see that in 2010, the bottom row of that bottom table, actual performance was an average of two minutes, which was quite poor in 2010. By 2012, that improved substantially to 0.63 minutes on average, and that's less than the non-binding target within the performance scheme of 0.7 minutes of delay. And then we're moving towards the unknown now of 2014 when there's a binding target under the performance scheme in the top row on states of half a minute. And just recently released last week, the binding target which has been proposed for the period 2015 to 2019 is also half a minute. So we're on target to reach that at the moment. But we've got quite low traffic levels and we're not expecting traffic levels or stat for aren't expecting traffic levels to recover to 2008 level until something like 2016. So we're still operating under slightly non-challenging um, conditions in terms of the um, traffic and passenger volumes. If we look at the particular month of September 2010 on which our model is based as you'll see in a moment we can look at some key statistics there. The average departure delay was slightly lower than the whole year in that month. It was 13.9 minutes. The average arrival delay minutes was 13.6. And reactionary delays were running at 46%. Now, if we look at what we produced in the model, so our simulation results, they produced, they were running 30,000 flights, give or take, um, on the simulation day, about 2.5 million passengers. And you can see that the average departure delay and arrival delay are pretty well 
calibrated, they're only 0.1 of a minute different from actual performance. And our reactionary delay was running slightly higher um, than the actual values um, in the network for that month. We also had to calibrate on other factors, for example, um, load factors in the aircraft, the occupancy rates of seats, and according to multiple AA sources, they were for September, they were somewhere between 75 and 78 percent for the month, and in our model we were running at 75 to 77 percent for the simulation day, representative of the month. It's very important that we get the load factors right and we modelled aircraft occupancy correctly, because of course we're looking at system performance for passenger connectivity, and the higher the load factors get, the lower the capacity for the system to recover and reaccommodate passengers. And it's been shown by a number of researchers, for example, Sherry et al. Uh, in 2010, that there's an exponential relationship between load factors and the number of flights you need to recover um, passengers from, from disruption. So it's a severe impact of increasing load factors um, on the capability of the system to recover from passenger disruption. Why is it important that we're focusing on passengers so much? Well, firstly, we have the policy-driven motivation that increasingly in documentation, high-level documentation from the Commission, for example, the White Paper, the Transport Area Plan for 2050, and the Strategic Research and Innovation um, Agenda from ACARI, we're increasingly talking about passenger, passenger mobility, and network resilience, which is music to our ears. If you open up the ACARI, strategic research document and search the, num the number of times the word passenger occurs, it'll be in there dozens and dozens and dozens of times, compared to, for example, some of the CESAR documentation, which is making very limited rec uh, reference, uh, understandably to a large extent, to the passenger context. So high-level commission documentation focusing on the passenger context, and also, of course, it's an operational driver of what's happening in the system. What we're actually doing in the system is we're not moving aircraft around. The ultimate performance delivery is to moving the passengers around and passenger, passenger delivery. And, if, and the dominating cost of delay to airlines is the cost of passenger delay. So that's driving airline behaviour, the way that they behave in the system strategically and tactically. Also important in terms of flight metrics, one can say, well, why don't you just measure the average delay of delayed flights? Surely that's pretty much the same as the average delay of a delayed passenger. In actual fact, they're not, because one can imagine that if you have a flight which is, say, one hour late, then every passenger on that flight, pretty much, I mean, we can think of some unusual circumstances, but pretty much every passenger on that flight will also be at least one hour late but quite a few of them might have missed a connection before they got on that flight, and those connections might be running every four hours. So quite a few passengers on the flight will be five hours late. So on average, the average delay of passengers compared to the average delay of flights is a factor of, from US simulations using non-explicit models compared to hours of passenger delay, give us a range of a difference between those factors of about 1.6 to 1.7. So they're not the same metrics at all. And we'll look, at, we'll look at the results from our model in the next half an hour or so. So essentially the bottom line question there is, how can we measure specific progress towards performance here, specifically with respect to passenger mobility and service delivery to the ultimate customer, if we don't have passenger-centric metrics in what we're measuring? Here are some of the costs we included in our model. So it's a fully costed model, as I've said. We include fleet costs at strategic level, which I'm not going to go into um, particularly today. The tactical costs of fuel burn we've taken from Lido, flight planning software, BARDA database, and manufacturer data. For the cost of crew delay, we include, we assess, we spent quite a few, about a year actually, looking at different crew payment schemes and we converted those to cost of minute delay. So we converted time-based and non-time-based crew mechanisms to time-based costs, so we can translate those in terms of cost of a minute of delay. And we looked at on cost to the airline and also overtime payments in some of our different cost scenarios. So everything we do, I should stress, is based on costs to the airline. We're always looking at airline costs at the moment. Maintenance cost, if an aircraft is hanging around at a gate, or swizzing around in a stack at Heathrow for goodness knows how long before it can land. That's obviously causing 
extra cost to the airlines in terms of extra wear and tear on the power plant and the airframe. For the passenger costs, it's important to differentiate between three different major types of passenger cost. The first one is hard cost of passenger delay, and by that is included uh, the cost of passenger care, so the airlines buying them a meal or giving them a, a voucher at the airport if their flight's delayed. The cost of reaccommodation, if they're still floating around in the airport at the end of the day with no flight, then they get shoved in a hotel, and obviously the airport has to, uh, the uh, airline, the, the, the airline would like it if the airport had to pay for that. The airline has to pay for that, and of course the cost of rebooking them onto another carrier if the airline chooses, or in future may be obliged to rebook the passenger onto another carrier. So all those are included in our costs. We've also got the soft cost of passenger delay, which is essentially the loss of market share that an airline will incur as a result of reduced punctuality. So if you have a reputation, or you're suspect, basically if you have a reputation for being unpunctual, your market share um, statistically is likely to decline as a result of that, and you will lose um, some revenue and we've built some cost models um, for that as well. So both of those, although the hard costs are directly visible in the airline's bottom line, the soft costs are normally, well, they're, they're not visible as, a, as an entry on the bottom line, but some airlines, not many, have some type of estimation for those, and we've worked with them to develop these soft cost models. So it's important we consider both of them. Normally the hard cost is larger than the soft cost, but there's quite a, a significant component contribution from soft costs. We've also got internalised costs, um, by which we mean things like um, passenger value of time, which we do not include in our models. So we only, as I just stressed, we're only including costs which impact on the airline's bottom line. So we don't include passenger value of time, which doesn't impact the airline, unless it's reflected through a hard cost or it's reflected through a soft cost. There are some overlap between these three cost categories and we've tried our best to differentiate between the three to resolve the overlap and only record costs which impact the airline. There's a difference here between the work that we've done and most of the work in Europe and that is undertaken in the States, whereas most research in the States does include passenger value of time and onward social costs. So their estimates of cost of delay tend to be much, much higher um, than, than ours, than European values. And you're looking at something like, I mean, there was... Um, during the period of, a, I think it was a four-year period in the UK, there were just under 200 different estimations published on estimations of um, value of time in UK transportation systems. So it's a very popular thing for academics to study in the UK. There's lots of numbers to choose from. We spent quite a while ploughing through those, trying to look for ones that were applicable in the airline context. And although we didn't apply them in the model, we recorded and reported on them. And we're looking at something like... Um, 30 to 50 euros for a value of time for, for one hour um, for a passenger. So you can imagine if you add those onto delay costs, as they do in the States, the total gets much, much higher. And these costs that we've used are the same ones that are used in PRR reports, and we'll be producing a new set of costs under our new Work Package E project, which we just started in 2014. So we're looking forward to that. As you probably all know, there's uh, a non-linear relationship between delay duration um, and delay cost. So if we look at two points and try and draw a straight line between them, the costs actually creep up at a supralinear rate, so it's a faster than linear rate. There's a, a non-linear relationship between delay cost and delay duration. Now what we've done previously is we produced these probabilistic uh, statistical estimations of these type of costs. And of course, in reality, it's not like that. It's much more lumpy, and the costs vary as connections are made and broken dynamically in the network as it evolves tactically. So a connection between two flights is suddenly broken, this aircraft speeds up, or the aircraft which is waiting then waits a bit longer, the connections are then made again, and the cost goes down. So it's not actually a nice smooth curve, it's more like a, it's more of a step function. And in fact, it's not even a nice step function, it's more of a, a wiggly escalator function because it's moving in time all the time as the passenger um, connectivities are made and broken. And that's something we've now assessed for the first time um, rather more rigorously in our simulations because, of course, they're relying on real-time costs of all these connections being made and broken.
So when's he going to get on to the actual thing everyone's saying? So OK, the answer is now. So what we've done is we've evaluated these different flight and passenger prioritisation strategies. We've included tactical costs to the airlines and we've modelled four different airline business models. Regional, low cost, full cost and charter. We've also used some metrics based on complexity science, which I'm going to talk a little bit about at the end of the presentation. Some key characteristics of the model is we're running a simulation day, which we chose eventually to pick, was uh, 17th of September 2010, which was a, a busy day in a busy month for that year. And I've just given you some performance comparisons of 2010 and 2012. We spent a long time going through the data, making sure that we'd picked a pretty non-exceptional day to make sure there weren't any bizarre delays anywhere, any enormous strikes or any particularly bad weather. We picked the busiest 199 ECAC airports and they essentially <coughs> covered 97% of the passengers and 93% of the traffic for 2010. It's really annoying now because every presentation we make, every paper we write, we have to say it was 199 airports and people well, why didn't they just do one more and make it 200? We started off with 200 and we couldn't get the data for Doncaster, so we're very embarrassed from the sake of England that there, weren't, there wasn't appropriate data for Doncaster, so it dropped off. And now we have to keep saying this rather stupid, annoying number, 199. It was tempting to say about 200. I mean, why are they saying about 200? So it's 199 airports, to our annoyance. And we included 50 non-ECAC airports, so 50 airports outside the ECAC region. So we're not just looking at the ECAC operations ring-fenced, we're looking at 50 major types of flow in and out of the region from outside of Europe, which we also got passenger and traffic data for those as well. We don't model those with high fidelity, but of course we need to model the system with all the long haul people coming in to look at the connectivity and passenger flow so everything adds up properly. We had to carry out an enormous, particularly my colleague Graham there, had to carry out an enormous range of range checks and logic checks on the data, on the PRISM traffic data, for example, checking some of the aircraft speeds, some of the speeds made in the database weren't feasible. Some of the registration sequences, when we try to track the aircraft from rotation to rotation through the day, some of the registration sequences were missing or invalid or broken. So we had to repair all of those. There were quite a large number of, as one would expect, cargo flights, servicing flights, positioning flights, circular flights. So we had to take all of those out as well. The taxi out data in the prism traffic data were, were unreliable, the taxi in data were missing and the IOBT field, the initial off block times, weren't a good representation of the schedule. So at the horrible point when we realised that, we then had to scratch around and beg Innovator to sell us all their airline schedule data for, for that month so we could backfill um, all the schedule data from the, uh, from the traffic data which is really quite a horrible task. Because if you imagine you've got missing data and you've got a whole bunch of flights which are one or two hours late, you then have to try and work out exactly what slot that aircraft was supposed to be operating at and what the schedule was in their algorithms to backfill the actual schedule time, which uh, wasn't a whole bunch of fun. And then we calibrated that against independent sources which we didn't use to build the model. So the calibration of average delay and load factors um, weren't used as inputs to the model. So what we hope we ended up with was a fairly unique combination of Paxis, i.e. passenger and traffic data. And the job we had to perform here, and my colleague Graham did, was aggregating the passenger data onto individual flights. So we have this high-level um, ticket-based data from, from IATA at the top, this Paxis data, and we then had to allocate those passengers individually um, onto flights using um, top-down and bottom-up um, algorithms, respecting seat configurations on aircraft by purchasing seat configuration data and respecting load factors targets. So it was no good if we put more passengers than a, an aircraft could accommodate or if all the aircraft were flying around with 95 or 70 or 60% load factors, then that's going to have a really significant impact on the um, uh, reliability of the model. All the itineraries we built respected the minimum connecting times at airports and published schedules. As I said, we've got about 30,000 flights in the day, 2.5 million passengers and 150,000 distinct routings operating every day.
If we now look at the simulation um, as we undertook it and some of the, the actual scenarios, the prioritization scenarios, the, the bread and butter of the actual model itself. So it's a full gate-to-gate -gate model with passenger connectivity rules incorporated and we've got varying levels of fidelity in the model. So for example, um, rule 23 is a slightly um, less robust, uh, sorry, less um, high fidelity rule when we allow the aircraft en route to make some delay recovery, so if they're, if they're late, they can make up some of that um, en route. And we allowed them to recover delay if, if there wasn't too much congestion on that route to within a five minute residual delay. So they'd always leave five minutes of residual delay. And I'm going to come on to that um, right at the end of the presentation and where we go next in terms of future developments of the model. So that was a relatively low fidelity aspect of the model and rule 23. There was a stochastic variable in there for wind. And then rule 23 was one of the, what we would hope could be described as a, a high fidelity aspect of the model, where we incorporated regulation 261, which we just looked at, IATA rules and airline practice and airline cost data. And the trigger, all of these rules have triggers. It's an event-driven model. It's event-driven, so all these rules have triggers. And the trigger for rule 33, as we'll see in a moment, is passengers arriving too late at a gate. They arrive at the gate and the aircraft, according to the rules, has decided not to wait. So the aircraft has, has legged it, is not there. The passengers then need to be reaccommodated. Something needs to happen with those passengers. So they get put into rule 33 that looks after them. We've got a whole bunch of passenger prioritization sub-rules for looking after these passengers in airports when they need reaccommodating. And as I've explained before, we include the hard cost of delay, we include the soft costs, We've recorded and reported on value of time, but they're not included in the cost model. And we had multiple, um, that's slight exaggeration, several airline sources contributing into that cost model. And then when we built Rule 33, we had a review from several airlines participating in our workshops to make sure that they were sensible. So for example, here are some of the rules for reaccommodating passengers according to the type of ticket the passenger had and the type of airline with whom they're flying and the type of delay up to two hours, two to five hours and more than five hours. So we can see, for example, just to take one example, on this bottom, on this bottom row, if you're flying with a low cost carrier, then they wouldn't pay for you to fly with somebody else even if you're there all day. They'd either send you back on one of their own flights or put you in a hotel and send you back the next day. They wouldn't pay for you to go business class with Lufthansa on the next flight, surprisingly enough. The way the rules worked is that airlines would try and rebook passengers onto their own flights first, because that's obviously cheaper for them. And for example, if Lufthansa wanted to rebook passengers onto Lufthansa 1234, then other rules in the system wouldn't then allow passengers to be reaccommodated onto that flight by another airline. And once the passenger had been reaccommodated, the fare for those remaining transfer legs got attributed back to the airline that caused the disruption, that caused the delay, as a delay cost to them, which is what happens in real life, according to IATA proration rules under disruption, the way the, the disrupting airline has to pick up the tab for the transfer. Another important aspect of the model, just to give another example, is turnaround delay recovery at the gate. So we modelled minimum turnaround times, modelled again by the four airline types, based on wake turbulence category and an airport size. And essentially, to cut a long story short, we made 95% confidence intervals, or the lowest two percentile compression rate that the minimum turnaround times could be pushed down to. So we ignored the extreme values on the left-hand side of the curve, but we allowed average turnaround times to be pushed down to this minimum compression rate if an aircraft needed to turn around a bit quicker to get off on time, realising that there's some buffer in these processes in the way the schedule works. So the actual model itself was an event-driven model running from an event stack. Every activity, as you'll see in a moment, has a timestamp associated with it, which is recorded in the output log. Um, some way through the project, our colleague Samu developed some wonderful pre-computed recursive cost functions to make the processing of the model rather quicker. So we weren't calculating every single cost every second dynamically. Some of them were using recursive pre-computed <coughs> cost functions. And on a cloud computing platform, to run one simulation took approximately two minutes. And the statistically, because we got stochastic variables in the way the model runs, the number of simulations, the results we got statistically were stable after about 10 runs, after 10 iterations. Although everything we report on the next few slides is actually based on 50 
on 50 runs, on 50 simulations. Here's an example of a bit of output in the output log from the model. And you can see that all these events happened within one second of the model, and they start at 12.25.00. And you can see at the bottom we're still in 12.25.00. So these are some of the events which fit into one second of the model. We can see here that a flight pushed back from uh, Dusseldorf a bit late and had an associated tactical cost of 127 euros with that delay. Then a few milliseconds later on, there's two passengers with inflexible tickets coming in to Dusseldorf that didn't make their connection, so they needed to be reaccommodated. And here we can see a reaccommodation rule, 33 here, trying to reaccommodate still 80 passengers in the reaccommodation pool at Dusseldorf Airport. And these rules are running um, continuously. And of course, some passengers in the reaccommodation pool, the, the, the passengers who need looking after, who need a new flight because they've missed a connection, or there was a cancelled flight, they might be in that pool for just a second. They might be reaccommodated immediately. Some of them might be in that pool all day. And at the end of the day, they still haven't found a new flight. So the model puts them in a hotel and charges the airline according to the cost model for that delay. And here we can see later on within the same second, there's 29 different groups of connecting passengers on an SAS flight coming in from Christiansund into Oslo. Here are the scenarios that we ran, the prioritization scenarios which we imposed on the simulations under which the simulations were run. First of all, all the simulations were run under a baseline scenario where no flight prioritization rules were applied, where we were trying essentially to mimic current operations. The first two types of prioritization scenario that we looked at, firstly we looked on prioritizing inbound flights simply based on the number of delayed passengers. Then we had another rule, N2, which is prioritising inbound flights which were delayed more than 15 minutes based on the number of onward connecting flights which would be delayed by those connecting passengers. So they're fairly simple rules, N1 and N2. They're based on either passenger numbers or flight numbers. And we sort of loosely associated with those with the sort of things an ANSP might be able to do based on ANSP information. So loosely based with an ANSP agency. And A1 and A2 are rather more sophisticated rules where the wait times and departure slots were actually calculated on a cost minimization basis. We had cost minimization protocols and algorithms in the software to try and minimize delay costs on departure for A1, also taking into account the prevalent ATFM delays based on current congestion modeled. And in A2, we added on to that independently arrival management as well. Then we looked at two different types of policy scenario, the sort of thing that an airline wouldn't do, but the EU at some point might say, well, you've got to start doing that a bit because things aren't working very well. What would happen under these policy contexts, P1 and P2, in the future under an exciting and enlarged regulation 261 or a variant of that? What could happen in the future? So we looked at passengers being reaccommodated based on prioritisation. Forget the ticket type. Let's look at your delay at your final destination. Let's focus on mobility, where you're trying to get to, and let's try and minimise all the passengers' delay based on arrival destination and prioritise them based on that. But respect the airline interlining hierarchy. So they'd still try and reaccommodate on their own carrier first, and they'd still try and reaccommodate within their own alliance first, if they could, because that's cheaper. That's policy one. Airlines might have a different name for it. And policy two was then we also relaxed the interlining hierarchy. So we said, OK, forget the ticket flexibility, and let's also forget the interlining hierarchies. Under this prioritisation scenario, the passengers get reaccommodated on any convenient flight, again, with a minimisation, with a prioritisation, based on delay at the final destination. So to summarise, M1 and N2 essentially focused on airborne arrival delay management. A1 is mostly tied up with Rule 13 on waiting time for boarding. A2 is the same as A1, plus some arrival management, which went horribly wrong, which we'll see later on. And then P1 and P2, passenger reaccommodation uh, rules, were mostly uh, tied up with Policy 1 and Policy 2. And just to take an example, I, I say it was, it was related to ATFM delay. This is a very quick look at how Rule 13 worked. So, for example, 
if ATFM delays in the system were more than 60 minutes, so there's quite a significant constraint on when flights could actually take off. They can't just choose, if they lost this slot, they weren't going to get a new ATFM slot five minutes later. So we had to take that into account in the airline decision-making process. So we're saying if ATFM delays in the system were more than 60 minutes, then the, uh, the airline had a, had a binary choice, basically to go now with the passengers it had, or to wait 60 minutes, assume we get another slot in 60 minutes' time, and calculate the cost. So it would calculate the cost of going now, or waiting 60, 60 minutes, and it would decide on the least cost to itself and make that choice. If the ATFM restrictions were rather less, so were less than 60 minutes, we sort of assumed the airline could get another slot in 15 minutes if things weren't too restricted. So the way their algorithm worked then, it would look 15, 30, 45, 60, 75 minutes ahead, and calculate the lowest cost alternative, and then that's how long the aircraft would then decide to wait for inbound connecting passengers. That's the way that cost minimization rule worked under scenario A1. Some results. What actually happened? The full report should be available relatively soon if Colin deems to accept our full reports, and I presume that will be available to interested people within the relatively near future, one, one hopes. If we look at this key table here of results, the classical results, we can see that on the left-hand side, we have a selection of some of the metrics that we investigated. So at the top, you can see that these ones at the top on the left-hand side are focusing on traditional metrics, such as flight departure delay and flight arrival delay. As you come down the table, you can see we're looking at metrics which aren't currently commonly recorded, for example, passenger departure delay and passenger arrival delay, and also the cost of delay um, to the airlines. Then across the top, we have the various prioritization scenarios we just discussed. So N and N, N1 and N2, the simple ones, P1 and P2, the policy ones, and A1, the um, cost minimization one. We'll come on to A2 in a minute. This now, that block there was the single most important result of the whole project, the reason we started doing it, is that we could see, although there are changes in the bottom part of the table, when we look at changes under these different prioritization scenarios, on the thresholds we set, we couldn't see statistically significant changes to performance based on the currently used flight departure and arrival delay metrics. So that was the single most important finding of the whole project, that you can't see them using those metrics. Now when you look at the passenger and cost metrics, there weren't significant changes there under the simple rules of N1 and N2. We're just doing things based on passenger numbers and number of connecting flights. They're fairly dumb rules and they didn't do very much either. When we looked at the policy one scenario, there were some weak improvements um, there, but nothing really to write home and shout about. When we looked at P2, this is the first time we start to get significant improvements, a small but significant, an average delay improvement for the arrival delay of an arrival delay passenger of um, 2.2 minutes per flight, which is you know, not, not bad going. But if you may remember that that's relaxing the airline interlining hierarchy, so that's, there's going to be some payback for that. And there it is, the average cost of delay for an average flight went up in the system by 26 euros. And that's because the airlines are paying to reaccommodate these passengers on other flights. So there's a cost for this improvement in performance. But when we look at A1, we can see there's even better improvement, much to our delight. The average delay of a de delayed passenger um, now is uh, an improvement of nearly 10 minutes. And the cost of delay per flight has gone down because these are cost minimization rules, so they will drive, they're focusing on driving down the cost, and by definition they will therefore drive down passenger delay, because passenger delay drives the airline costs. So we get two for one in this sense, and that we improve on both of those metrics. But of course you never get something for nothing, so what, well very rarely, or it's quite suspicious, you get something for nothing, and we can see that the amount of reactionary delay in the network as a whole went up by a couple of percentage points under scenario A1. And I'm going to look at those in the remaining um, 15 minutes or so of the, of the presentation. 
Here we have a plot of the total daily reactionary and arrival delay by the number of airport movements. So we've got, sorry it's a little bit small, we've got basically um, airport size along the bottom and delay up on the side. The blue line is for reactionary delay and the red lines are for arrival delay. And we can see they're relatively similar magnitudes, relatively similar patterns and obviously the line goes up to the right because larger airports are associated with more reactionary and arrival delay. But there was a considerable ratio difference at a number of the 40 smaller airports. We see there was a much larger tendency there for arrival delay to actually double or triple into reactionary delay on the outbound dependencies of those flights, which again we'll come on to in a minute. So we're getting a suspicion here that something's happening at smaller airports which is playing a bad role um, in the network, statistically. And we're going to look at that using some of our network analysis on the last few rather colourful slides. You might want to get your sunglasses on for on some of these blob slides later on. Here we look on the bottom at the average time until reactionary delay is absorbed, that's the delay on the left-hand axis, compared to airport size on the bottom. And unsurprisingly that doesn't really increase as a function of the airport size where that delay was generated, which is a reassuring finding. We then looked at the longest origin to termination branches of propagation using recursive searches down these propagation trees. So we, we watched down all the propagation trees how long it took for a reactionary delay to trigger down the propagation tree of the network during the whole day and how long it took before that stopped or got absorbed somewhere. And under the baseline scenario, S0, on average those went on for 268 minutes in total, the total amount of time until it was absorbed. And for A1, under our cost minimisation scenario, that was slightly longer um, at 272, which relates to the fact that we're increasing the amount of reactionary delay in the network under A1. So we've got some summary findings here based on A1. First of all, it increases the amount of reactionary delay in total in the network by two percentage points, from 49 to 51%. But that wasn't smoothly distributed across flights in the network. It was focused on a relatively small number of aircraft waiting for a longer amount of time for these connecting passengers. So it was, it was a purposeful implementation within the model where according to the cost minimization weight, weight rules, a relatively limited number of aircraft were waiting a longer amount of time to pick up and carry these disrupted passengers, which is where the um, saving and disruption costs came from. And that was one of the um, key outputs in the model that we were able to look for the first time at explicit reactionary delay rather than statistical models thereof. We found that small airports were possibly more heavily implicated in delay propagation than might be commonly recognised hitherto. And we can understand why that might be the case because probably at smaller airports you have a lower capacity for expedited turnaround. You might have lower spare handling agent resources, for example, to speed up a turnaround. You've probably got fewer crew resources, which we also included in, in the model. And of course, at smaller airports, you've got lower onward connectivity and capacity options for reaccommodating the passengers. We also found, also found by a couple of other researchers as well, that back propagation is an important component of the way that delay propagates and is sustained in the network. And if you don't know back propagation is whereby an aircraft leaves, let's say, particularly a hub with a delay, it goes to the outstation, particularly on shuttle flights, it goes to an outstation with a delay, that delay isn't recovered and it brings the same delay back to the original hub and then carries it out again and it keeps on doing that, either getting worse or staying the same during the operational delay. And we found that that back propagation was particularly heavy at Char de Gaulle, Madrid, Frankfurt, Heathrow, Zurich and Munich, all of those had more than 100 hours of back-propagated delay during one operational uh, day. And we're going to look a little bit of that in some of those colourful blob pictures um, in the last few slides. Although my colleague at Enaxis might be a bit annoyed if I describe them as blob pictures, they're really rather far more clever than I can understand, but uh, we'll look at those uh, in a moment. Now, every project has its um, a bit of a black sheep, something that didn't quite work as we expected. We could pretend we expected this, but we didn't really expect it. A2, you're saying, well, why, why, wasn't, why didn't you show me the results of A2? A2 didn't quite work as we expected. You may remember that A1 was when we prioritised flights on the outbound, and A2, on a cost minimisation basis, and under A2, 
we, tried, we added an independent rule of arrival management cost minimization as well. That didn't quite work, and apparently we're still investigating this in a bit of head scratching. We've checked the rules, and in fact, neither of those used new rules that weren't implemented in another module already. So we're, we're pretty happy, I think. We're fairly happy that all the rules are working okay, and this is a genuine effect, but we haven't quite got to the bottom of explaining the minutiae of it at this precise moment in time. But there was some discord between, because they were operated independently, there was a disconnection between the, the departure management and the arrival management processes, and that was reflected in the fact we got a higher dispersion in all the core metrics, and A2 also drove up the reactionary delay ratio to its highest point of any scenarios, up to 58%. And there's some limited um, support or evidence of these type of effects, for example, in some US models by um, Cran and Hansen, when they also observe non-linear delay multi uh, multiplier effects um, based on arrival queuing at some of the major US airports. So it wasn't the result we are expecting, but interestingly, uh, interesting enough for us to explore and understand more in future exactly um, the mechanics of, that, uh, of those causes. I said near the start that the average delay of delayed passenger wasn't the same as the average delay of delayed flight. And here I've given you some of the ratios of uh, those two delays for the baseline day, for a high delay day, which we uh, simulated, and a high cancellation day, which we simulated. Now the high delay day, we have essentially increased the average departure delay in the network from 13.9 minutes to 14.9. We essentially shoved an extra minute of departure delay into the network. And on the high cancellation day, we increased the number of cancellations in the network by 1% for the morning operation. So we just shuffled things up a bit and gave the, the network something to think about by throwing in an extra 1% of cancellations. And as we can see, generally, A1 for the baseline day in particular and for the, uh, with a much lower effect, we can't see it in, two decimal, in one decimal place for the high delay day, but for the baseline delay and high cancellation day, A1 generally aligns the passenger delay metric more closely with the flight delay metric. And that's essentially because there are more flights waiting for more people to make their connections. So the two delay metrics start to get closer together under the scenario A1. It also shows that the scenarios were, the prioritization rules were pretty robust under increased delay and high cancellation. And although A1 here didn't improve uh, from the 1.5 values. We got the improvement here and here, but not under high delay. The other metrics, the um, average delay of arrival delay for passengers, the average departure delay, and the costs all did improve under the high delay day, the same way it did under the baseline day. So A1 performed similarly well under disruption as it did under the baseline day, although it wasn't reflected in that particular metric. And as I said before, the US literature results suggest ratios of about 1.6 to 1.7, but they're probabilistic models not using explicit passenger connections. Now we're going to come on in the last sort of five minutes or so to some complexity science, which is part of what our research network is all about. We look at things like emergent behaviour, and emergence is a key concept, a key facet of, of complex systems, um, which have a different, variety of different names, complexity science, complexity theory. Essentially, the systems can't be explained by an understanding of the sum of the parts. So if we understand the agency of the, uh, the behaviour of the individual agents, that's not sufficient for us to be able to predict how the network behaves and the type of results we get from the network. So you get emergent, um, if you like, non-predictable behaviour. And a very early example of this, going way back to 1872, was as we might remember from our chemistry school days, was the structure of ice and water, and that you cannot possibly predict the phase diagram of water based on an understanding of the behaviour of hydrogen and oxygen atoms. So you can't predict the network, the aggregate behaviour of the system, based on even a precise understanding of the individual atomic behaviour. And I think it's quite exciting, maybe I should get out more, but I think it's quite exciting that we have phase diagrams for water, um, for transitions between solid gas 
um, in liquid in physics, and we also can produce now phase diagrams for delay transitions and tipping points of delay transitions, um, so we can treat the delay in the ATM network very much like we treat um, physical phase diagrams. Now, one of the components that we looked at applying um, to understanding what's going on in the network is Granger causality. And this very clever chap won a Nobel Prize for developing these algorithms, these methods for detecting and establishing causality between time series. And of course, the problem is that when you start looking at things on a network basis, you can count things like reactionary delay, you can count things like cost. But when you start looking at a network aggregate level based on output data, if you're not tracking them through propagation trees, then in those situations, how do you establish um, causality? And the problem with, of course, traditional techniques, classical techniques, correlation analysis, is that we then can't establish causality. So if we look at this rather horrendous plot of all the delay correlation coefficients between the 199 airports, it's just a complete mess. Because we can imagine that at 8 o'clock in the morning, pretty much everywhere is suffering some type of delay. So if we look at correlation coefficients, we'll get a delay between an airport here and an airport here, which can't possibly be causally connected because there's no connecting flights, no connecting passengers between them. They're thousands of miles apart, and this one happened 15 minutes after that one. So it's an absolute mess if we just look at raw correlation coefficients. We can try and be a bit more discriminating and look at things like the number of flights between the airport pairs to establish connectivity, or we can look at discriminatory patterns such as the number of direct and indirect passengers. And can that help us build something better in terms of causality using classical techniques? Well, the answer was no. We tried doing this with, or we couldn't anyway, using, um, for example, factor analysis, and it's plagued by these problems of, of having these artifactual correlations between, as I just mentioned, unconnected and remote pairs. And it's very difficult to put weighting thresholds back into those calculations to establish causality um, between the airport pairs. So in parallel to this, we ran a Granger causality analysis, and my colleagues at Inaxis um, did this, one of the many things they did. And we, here, a Granger causality is defined, if you have a time series Q, um, is considered to Granger cause another time series P, um, if inclusion of the past values of Q can improve the forecasting of P. I think that's a reasonably accurate summary of what, of what it does. And interestingly, if we have, for example, two time series which have a very high correlation, or two time series which are forced by a third system, then usually they will fail the Granger causality test because Q isn't adding new information to P. So they would apparently look like they're related and would have a very high correlation coefficient, but they would fail a causality test. So we built, model, we built these model networks for the flight delays and the passenger delays for the baseline scenario and A1 <coughs> scenario, looking at what's happening between the different nodes in terms of connectivity. So now's the time to put your sunglasses on. And these took 120 hours each on a pretty good spec machine to build these networks. And the more red, these are all the airports, this is a figurative representation, so there's no particular relationship of where a blob is in the diagram, except the ones on the outskirts tend to be less implicated in delay propagation, the ones in the centre tend to be more implicated. So the more red a blob is, they're all, all these dots are airports, implies a higher connectedness in terms of delay propagation, connected to more airports, other airports, and the larger the blob, means the more nodes were forced in terms of delay. So that it was having a stronger effect in terms of the causality of out degree of delay propagation pushed out onto another airport from that one. So basically, the redder and the bigger a blob is, the more of a troublemaker it is in the network. So this is the flight delay for the baseline, and this is flight delay under A1. And it's completely different. The rules of A1 have changed the way the network operates. It's changed the characteristics and the causality patterns in the network. And we were quite stunned by some of these results in the fact that when we looked at the centrality measurements, we looked at the characteristics of the networks and ran statistical tests on that, we found that all four networks were statistically very, very different. So the passenger layer and the flight layer under the baseline scenario 
we're different from each other in the, terms, in the way that delay propagates through the network because, of course, we can imagine we have delay propagating from airports where there are no direct flights, but there are indirect connecting passengers. There's a very high proportion of delay propagation in networks between airports which aren't connected by flights. So it's not that surprising, although pleasingly we detected it, um, that those two layers are very different. And equally, in both situations, when we apply the A1 prioritization scenario rule, that also changed the network completely under the rule, the characteristics of the network. So the airports play different roles in terms of delay propagation under those rules. And an interesting result there is we found that delay propagation under scenario A1 um, is contained, generally speaking, within smaller um, airport communities. So it's more contained in smaller communities, but those communities were more susceptible to delay propagation. So there's obviously a trade-off there in the effects of A1 on system performance. And slightly surprising to us, we thought there'd be quite a lot of big hubs playing roles in this, but the largest persistent airports in those model layers were not that massive. We're looking at airports like Athens, Barcelona and Ataturk. And we, in fact, had similar findings on some earlier vulnerability analysis that we ran on these network data. And uh, Flerkin et al. earlier this year had some similar results using complexity theory applied to a US model using non-explicit passengers, where they found it was the smaller airports that were having many of these effects, and the larger airports were less persistent in the different model layers. For example, there, there was um, San Francisco and Newark that were the only two persistent airports in those delay patterns. Okay, I've got two minutes left to do two slides or so of, of where we go next. What we're going to do next with the project. Firstly, as I mentioned earlier on, we're going to hopefully introduce some enhancements to do with the en route delay modelling, particularly with respect to dynamic cost indexing, which as you may know, essentially a, a flight's chugging along, it's, it realises it's got a whole bunch of connecting passengers who aren't going to make their connection unless it speeds up. So that the, the crew, relatively early on in the flight, obviously it's too late to make it late on, of course, has to decide whether to speed up or slow down. And we're in discussions with a number of airlines at the moment, and we've included that in another work package project. We're just finishing that case study now, um, in fact, in Cassiopeia, where we're looking at these rules and the effect um, on the network of these type of rules. And it's amazing how a number of airlines, which have been very frank with us, will say that they currently use rules of thumb for um, en route delay recovery. For example, a rule of thumb um, might be, when my delay gets more than 15 minutes, I'll try and recover all of those 15 minutes. Without bearing in mind that, of course, recovering the last five minutes of those 15 probably doesn't make an awful lot of economic sense, because in terms of extra fuel burn, those extra five minutes are going to be very, very expensive compared to an improvement in passenger connectivity from going from 15 down to zero minutes isn't massively improved. So it's quite a steep U-curve for the cost-benefit analysis of that type of recovery. And we've done estimations that roughly a medium-sized airline operating over a year, operating these rules of thumb, instead of properly cost minimization rules, would lose something in the region of 5 million euros a year in terms of uh, mistake and decision making. We also hope to improve the fidelity of the ATFM modelling and look at things like cost recoveries, which currently aren't implemented in the model. As well as the disrupted days, we could pretty much introduce any amount of disruption in the day. So we could simulate things like localised or even more widespread um, disruption, like an ash cloud, for example. We can also build, because of the lovely way that Inaxis have, have built the model, we can introduce other metrics. For example, we can look at some of the RP2 delay targets and we could model UDPP rules in the model to see what type of effect different UDPP rules will have based on other assumptions in the model. It'd be quite interesting to look at other things evolving in the future, for example, future traffic levels, aircraft sizes. We've particularly mentioned the importance of load factors, and we might model the effect of increasing load factors. We could look at new airline policies for disruption recovery. We could model new um, we've already done this a little bit with P1 and P2. We could look at the impact of new regulation impacts um, from the Commission in the model. And also, what we focus at the moment, because the way that our work is operating within the complexity science network, within Word Package E, there tends to be a little bit of a focus on complexity metrics, 
network science, um, complexity network theory, and so on and so forth at the aggregate level, but rather interesting for airlines would be to focus on some of these impacts for an individual airline and its route structure, uh, maybe within an uh, alliance or based out of a particular airport, for example. And we're also talking with a couple of software and application service providers about integration of this tool within tactical and strategic planning for airlines. Finally, if we look at the development <coughs> landscape of what's happening within Cesar at the moment, we've got in the one corner, as it were, the performance scheme and the planning for reference period three. In the other corner, we've got the more established performance target, which we're still working to within Cesar and ACARI, for example, the Research and Innovation Agenda. So within these four developments, where in this, where do these metrics, where do these prioritisation scenarios sit within the context of these four evolving contexts? And on that very simple question, I will shut up and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm sure that was all crystal clear for everybody. We've got 15 minutes or more if you want for questions. Pick up on that last thing, which I think is actually a question I have to write down. Uh, with respect to integrating uh, passenger oriented metrics in future target setting processes, be it RP3 or within SESA kind of development by like digital status, um, how much do you see sort of target setting at the passenger level rather than at the, at the flight or under? Who is the type of issues you have identified? Because the gate gate issue, uh, looking at the passenger delay, because great because of all the other issues, uh, and the model bank needs to be involved in this. How much leeway is there for real hard targets at passenger oriented metrics? Or do you think it's more sort of in, in implied improvement of these metrics, but you still need to focus on them more hard Thank you. Yes, so, so thank you. So the extent to which I, I guess it's practicable to implement these type of performance metrics in, into, um, into RP3. Within the timescale that we have, I guess it would, be, it would be desirable to implement these type of metrics within the performance framework, within, uh, within RP3. But I think maybe looking towards the second part of your question in terms of how we might achieve that practically, it might be more instructive rather than setting them as KPIs, as binding targets on states. It might be more instructive to get an insight into system performance to set them as performance indicators, i.e. non-binding uh, non targets within RP3. And even if we weren't um, advanced, if we couldn't quite get there by 2020 in terms of what we're doing, because it's obviously not that far away, we might well be able to build even more robust models and to quantify the relationships between the flight-centric metrics and the passenger-centric metrics. So we can say, for example, that within, if we can reach these types of improvement on these flight-centric metrics, then we can predict with this type of confidence we're achieving um, this type of improvement on the, on the passenger metrics. But there's still some work to be done for, uh, for sure in terms of quantifying that, but that might be an acceptable um, middle option rather than introducing full-blown um, passenger-centric KPI, certainly in terms of binding target setting within, uh, within RP3. Yeah, because uh, I would imagine that another issue with that would be who would be actually be the owner of reaching those targets? Who, so who is, needs to be bound for those for achieving those targets? Yes. And uh, for these passenger-centric metrics, it goes there's so many variables and factors influencing them. It would be difficult to assign any speeds, for example, for yes. SPS users. Yes. Indeed. So I, I think I, I, I agree, and I think for that, um, in that context, al although they would help in terms of understanding system performance better, and certainly I think the, the airlines obviously welcome this, uh, the developments we've made in terms of understanding the impact on, on their bottom line. I think for, from a practical point of view, then focusing on performance indicators rather than binding targets, and to understand the relationship between the f flight and passenger metrics and the cost metrics might be an uh, appropriate implementation level, and something that we could probably achieve more readily by the time that those targets are starting to be agreed for, for RP3. Just a question on the scenarios and the airports. Uh, you said you, you used 50 airports which are outside ECAP, mm -hmm. which are quite differently addressed by CFNU in terms of uh, 
slots. Mm -hmm. So that was taken into account in the market? Essentially, those, they were, there were 50 major flows from outside ECAT. So essentially what we did, we didn't model the, the slots of those. We looked at the times that those flights mm -hmm. arrived according to schedule. We had stochastic variables around those for the actual arrival delay um, on the day in the simulation model. We didn't model what happened to them outside the system. They just arrived with their long-haul uh, interconnecting passengers arriving in the way they did on the actual simulation day. So we just, we, we couldn't fully model what happens in the rest of the world, but we didn't want to have a ring fence model only looking at what happens within the, the 199 um, ECAC. So it's, it's a halfway house between, it certainly wasn't a high fidelity full simulation of what's happening with those passengers, but they, all of those passengers and their flows and connections were included. They did arrive in the model and then start seeding onward connection and they did have onward um, slot implications in the rest of the model once they, once they had arrived. But their, their slot allocations and, in, and indeed, for example, delay recovery on inbound um, transatlantics, which might be interesting to look at in the future, um, were, were not modelled. The question I have and I think interest for us would be uh, what would be the impact of reducing this delay on the environmental uh, there will be some impact in terms of uh, um, flight efficiency or Yes, um, that's really quite complicated and something which would be quite nice, um, quite nice to look at. There's, a, there's, there's going to be a mixed set of trade-offs there. We've got some, some benefits on efficiency and impact um, factors, for example. Um, there'll be a number of instances when an aircraft uh, might make a decision to speed up when it wasn't necessary an aircraft um, might be running at a gate with engines running um, when it might be, if it had prior knowledge of it, it made a decision to wait 60 minutes or, f or 30 minutes, then there might be fuel burn savings um, there, for example. So there's a number of um, positive impacts that we can anticipate or we can, yes, we, we can estimate might be introduced as a result of improved performance monitoring. And there would be some negative consequences of that as well. When an aircraft, um, through some of these trade-off uh, mechanisms, realised it, ha it had a net cost benefit to actually burn a bit more extra fuel and speed up and recover some of its 15 minutes, for example, on en route delay to make good some of the connections, but maybe not to recover down to that residual five minutes. So there's, there's certainly a, a set of trade-off functions um, within the model um, that we'd like to look at. And we, we've done that a little bit more uh, in one of our other work package e projects, um, Cassiopeia, specifically uh, on the en route uh, factors. Maybe that's a nice idea for another project to actually look at some of these uh, metrics specifically looking at, um, um, at the um, environmental impacts. We could, we could start to pull something out on that now already because as part of the model we're also calculating the, um, the fuel burn costs and they're recorded for each of the simulations. We haven't had time to look at those in any detail at the moment but we could start attaching costs and carbon costs uh, to those already actually. So we, we could start to do something under the scenarios already um, which would be quite interesting. So thank you for raising that, uh, that point. What is the uh, size of the funding for such a project? This was a small project. So we got th it was uh, 300,000 euros. I forgot to say that I'm impressed by the project. Yeah, really. Yeah. I think it's great. I thank you thank very you. much for the presentation. It was crystal clear. That's very kind. I didn't get all the details just in one hour. That's for sure. But I found it extremely important. I think it's important that now we, we spread that information. Uh, we, I was just thinking about the amendment to the regulation. Mm -hmm. I mean, are the EC people in, informed about these findings? I, I, I mean, the research area, I would make sure that the policy people are informed, but having already made the link, that's what I would no, like no, to make. No, no, Not yet. yet. No, no. I think uh, your question is very interesting. We'll be disseminating results back to IATA thanks to their um, initial help with setting all this up, of course. Um, and thank you again for your for your kind comments. Our, our major contact at the moment with um, with the framework program, I guess. Uh, is within the, the Meta uh, CDM project, an FP7 project. So we've got some, some good links we'll built with that project. We'll be making some presentations of our findings into that project. So we've got some feed, um, some feed into FP7. And obviously we're looking at how some of these findings, particularly with respect to um, building on some of the 
uh, the simulations um, with regard to future regulation changes might might be explored further in um, within Horizon 2020 um, um, as well. Did you get to pay something to IATA or? Oh yes, the data wasn't the data weren't the data weren't free. But they were they were very generous in the in the help they gave us because um, without their help in the provision of the ticket data, then the project wouldn't have even started. So we spent several months in the proposal stage talking to the very helpful people in Montreal who were very kind in accommodating us as a poor university in terms of what we had to pay for the um, for the passenger data to make the project viable. Because otherwise, we would have used let's say a substantial amount of the budget before we it, it wouldn't have worked as a, as a project without their support. Research results. What are the other like future topics, long-term future research, mm -hmm. which you foresee, for example? I think one thing we're quite well. There's a number of there's aspects of the model which we want to improve. For example, the um, the fidelity of some of the um, some of the rules, particularly building a bridge out to, um, for example, measuring some of the um, RP2 um, performance targets. I think there are a number of I guess the original motivation for the project is to try and close the gap, a, a, a slight disconnection between high-level EU policy and the bottom-line metrics we're using in measuring system performance. So we really want to try and bridge that gap, as Dimitris already raised, how we, how we bring those closer together, even if we can't fix everything and do every dot, every um, I and cross every T by 2020. Can we move closer to bringing what we consider to be an, import, uh, an important context into that framework um, by 2020. And the other thing we always try and do um, as best we can in our work is to try and make sure it has operational um, applicability. So we're really very, very keen um, to do two things in particular. One is to um, talk to nice people who are planning the uh, UDPP development and see how our work might be able to complement some of the great work that's going on there. And secondly, to talk to some of the um, software providers for, for airline tools, for example, in scheduling and tactical and delay cost recovery, to make sure that the, the project also has, and development of the project also has an operational applicability. And again, it's good for us because it's nice to spend time with the airlines, the potential users and people who might benefit from this type of work to make sure that what we're doing is, is making economic sense, fits in with airline decision making. And there's nothing like that than to sit down and be um, constructively criticised by a bunch of airlines in terms of what we need to do to the model in terms of improving this and improving that, and how we can help them improve their operations um, through, these, um, through these type of tools. So we've had a discussion um, a few weeks ago with one of the major software service providers and, and a group of airlines as to how we might start um, moving that forward beyond, beyond the project. Uh, thank you again, Andrew. You may be interested to know that the uh, Cassiopeia project will be doing a presentation similar to this one in... Uh, three weeks' time, I think, but that's in the new. Um, we have new projects. This is one of our old batch of projects in Work Package E. We have uh, 22 new projects which have recently started. Since you're kind of economics kinds of people, we have one uh, where Andrew is leading, or, or Westminster are leading, uh, on uh, complexity cost, the cost of complexity in the network, which I think it will extend this mm -hmm. and reuse a lot of it. In Axis, by the way, are uh, uh, running a project on secure data with the uh, consortium from uh, Istanbul and others. We're looking at things like strategic uh, slot allocation uh, using some innovative methods and uh, manipulating traffic flows using route charges as some kind of uh, levers to improve traffic flows. So we have a number of other economic style of projects. If you want to follow any of those, then look at the website or come and talk to me um, and I can put you in contact with that. You mentioned that your document will be published as soon as uh, the administrative... It's been, uh, for me, it's uh, been uploaded to the SJU. It needs the SJU to give a final rubber stamp. Yeah, and then it's public uh, It belongs to the uh, consulting. So as far as we're concerned, it's public in that sense, yeah. The will be published in the extranet, the SJU It's on the extranet, but not everybody has access, access, of course, to the extranet, so you would go to Andrew to... Uh, get that. I don't know what you plan to do with it. Um, yeah, I mean, we've got dissemination activities which will continue after the project, but if, if people don't get the report that we'd, we'd, we should reach as part of dissemination activity, then anyone who applies, sends us uh, an email, will be very happy to send them a copy of the report. And 
Oh, so it's public, but only external. That's what you said. Well, that's not public, of course. Like, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> because that's one of the, the big internet big, is the public, difficulty yeah. we have. Yeah, some IPR rights. So it has really to be public, public. The IPR is owned by the consortium, so it's quite owned by Westminster, and uh, so they have to, uh, I guess, uh, it's up to them. But there are a number of uh, number of papers that you've published, mm -hmm. actually, um, in the Cesar Innovation Days, in a couple of one or two journals. You've got a couple of other things coming up. So there's there's some general so there's some publications are a bit more accessible, by the way, because the final report is 100 and how many pages? 135 or something. 40 pages or something. So if you want some published papers which make it a little easier, there's an, uh, one just being, I suppose, which summarizes the whole project, submitted for the next Cesar Innovation mm -hmm. Days in Stockholm subject to a, a, a acceptance. Absolutely. So uh, get back to us if you want more information on, on those as well. And also if you want to be involved, there's a couple of workshops associated with the new projects, one in February, March, I think, mm -hmm. if you want to be involved in those and let us know. Very, very quickly. We, we have got, as I say, uh, we've got a number of dissemination activities which run beyond project closeout. So essentially stakeholders that have participated in our workshops, our airline contacts, we've got an airline um, delay cost management working group with about 30 airlines in, in that and ANSPs. We have contacts in the SJU on that distribution, on that distribution list and within the commission and within um, our, uh, the FB7 project and within the UDPP group as well. So we do our best in terms of direct uh, dissemination and anyone who happens to and through that process or through other activities, through other publications, knows about the project, then once we have the green light, um, we then basically make, we, we, we're then happy to distribute that, uh, that, that project report as a, as, a, as a public document. Did you uh, try to match your project under the, the funding available, or you had some idea previously that uh, suddenly it was quite simple? We had an idea uh, for quite a long time which we were itching to explore and then the funding, the, the mechanism for making these proposals into work package E, the competitive funding mechanism came on afterwards. So we'd been planning to do something like this for a while, then work package E in its current form came online with a call for competitive tenders so we were, we were pleased to be able to make a proposal into that and then, we, and then getting the funding through that mechanism. So in, in this case it was something we would, we'd been planning to do and wanted to put into this um, into this funding stream when the when the when the call came out. I just have a question, maybe more for the CISO here. Um, based on those results, uh, is there a discussion ongoing on how it can be uh, put into more the, the core business of uh, CISO? Well, um, the links which uh, will be at, at this stage at the moment is basically to uh, consider these results, these research results to be considered in the next long term RD program, research program. And that is uh, the, the topics and these correlations will be considered at this, at this stage. And then this will be communicated, of course, for with the uh, the rest of the management. So at the moment, for the long-term research, this will be considered and also they will be communicated to the scientific committee, they will be considered also in the long-term research plan. But even beyond the long-term research, within the, the other activities in the program, we will take stock of the results, which are now just being released. Um, and, then, and then we're going to have a, a discussion not only at the SCU level, but also the members in the program, to, for them to also be, be fully aware of the kind of work that's been done here. And then we can see how we can accommodate some of these results into uh, yes. setting validation targets, for example, or assessing performance assessment mm -hmm. results. So uh, yeah. that, and that's the reason why we're doing uh, We're trying to incorporate long-term research and projects like these results into the other areas of the program. So there is a connectivity, and they will be discussed. Let's thank Andrew again for the presentation.